it has a bit of delay, so don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not 5.30, let me just add these folks and then we start. We're gonna hear that pinging sound for a while because there are people who will join. Remember guys that I'd like you to keep your microphones uh, muted when you're not um, speaking. When you start to speak, remember to unmute yourself. I'm going to ask those who are joining us on the Zoom chat who are not part of the core panel to keep your microphones muted because the feedback tends to be very problematic uh, when we have it like that, so. All right, guys, so uh, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Hume Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual panel discussion. And if you see me looking over here, it is because I'm looking at my, my notes on how to pivot and position your personal brand after COVID-19. I'm so excited that given that we're asked to socially distant, that we're still able to come together in this way for this important conversation. For those watching and listening to us on Facebook or on this Zoom chat, we have a really diverse panel with us. You're gonna love it. Uh, six powerful uh, men, uh, six women and one man who have been busy establishing their personal brand and using it to navigate a very competitive business environment and a competitive job market. And they're not, where they want to be yet because they're ambitious people with a lot of uh, goals, but they're doing really well in establishing their personal brand and leveraging it in, in the way that they want to achieve the successes that they want. We're going to meet them, we're going to hear their stories, and we're going to learn from them and we're going to steal some of their ideas <laughs> as well. So joining us, uh, let's begin with Donna Peer. Uh, she is research uh, Project Coordination Officer at the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva. Say hello, Donna. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. <laughs> I believe it's like 11.30 in Geneva right now. So I, I appreciate your commitment, uh, Donna. I hope I remain you know, okay. coherent throughout the, the evening. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Me too. And second in line, we have Davina Lane, and she's the executive director of Intimate Hotels of Barbados. And I believe Davina is in Guyana right now because she is the outgoing operations and training lead for the Guyana Tourism Authority. I think you're stuck in Guyana, right, Davina? We'll hear more about that. Yes, I am. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and we have Diani uh, Winter Funday. Esquire, she's manager and uh, founding partner of Winter Law Practice in Tampa in Florida. Unmute your microphone, Diane, so we can hear you. Thank you for having me. I'll have to practice doing that all evening. Um, thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. No worries. And we have Andrea Williams, who's a regional operations manager of Go Health Urgent Care and that's in Connecticut, uh, United States. Say hi, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Unmute your microphone. No, I'm muted now. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And we have Colleen Douglas and she's in Jamaica. She's uh, the communications and marketing director at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. Say hello to everyone, Colleen. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. Great, no worries. And then we have Georgia Bryce. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and life coach. And she's in South Florida in the United States. In the rainy city of Hallandale Beach. Hi, everybody. Glad to be on with you, Dr. Hume. Yeah, so great that you're here, uh, Georgia. And last but certainly not least, we have Damian Williams. He's a community development consultant. He's a community development consultant and transformation coach. Uh, Damian is originally from uh, Grenada, but you can't tell him that he's not Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> he's in Jamaica. <laughs> Say hi, Damian. Yeah. Hello, thanks for having me, Human. It's an honor to be among such powerful women this afternoon. 
No worries at all. And I'm your moderator for today. For those who don't know me, who are, who, who are watching on Facebook or on our Zoom chat today, I'm president of Hume Johnson Consulting. And it's a Rhode Island communications firm where I really help leaders, uh, executives, entrepreneurs to define and really mobilize their personal brand. And I also help them to communicate their brand message with clarity, with confidence, and with credibility. My side gig, as I love to call it, I'm an associate professor of communications at Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. I was a former journalist with the Jamaica Information Service Television Department, and I was also with Radio uh, Jamaica, a group of companies uh, in Jamaica. I was also working in the public sector in Jamaica as a political speechwriter with the government of Jamaica. These days, um, I focus more on political scholarship. Uh, I, I look at governance and civil society, and also the, the brand of nations, nation states, and particularly the nation brand of Jamaica. And I focus on the governance challenges that may be impacting on Jamaica's image and perception in the world. But this afternoon, I'm not gonna focus on nation branding. We're gonna focus on personal branding and COVID-19. Uh, I, I mean, December 31st, New Year's Eve, everybody was knocking glasses together and we were saying 2020 is gonna be our year. You know, we're gonna dominate. <laughs> we had so many plans for travel and every June I usually travel somewhere in the world and, and you know, do my research and take a vacation and you know, uh, COVID-19 threw us a big curveball, you know, disrupted our lives, disrupted our plans, disrupted our projects. But as we emerge from COVID-19, and this is really just the first phase, we're not saying that it's over. We're saying that as we emerge, we are forced into new ways of being and new ways of, of doing things. And we must adapt how we socialize. We are adapting how we learn, how we communicate. And we also, quite frankly, we have to recalibrate, we have to refocus, we have to reimagine ourselves and our careers and see how we can navigate it in new and innovative ways. And we want to find out how do we navigate this new normal and what role does personal branding play in all of that? And, 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 and who better to help us to, to have this conversation than people who are actively involved in building their own brand and reimagining it during this very um, interesting and difficult a moment. I'm excited to hear your stories and your perspectives. And so to get things going, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your, your background, your experience. But to the audience, before we get to that, thank you so much for your interest in this online panel discussion. This conversation is incredibly important because at its core is about us empowering each other so that we can better each other and become allies um, for each other. And we can't do that unless we start communicating uh, with each other. Uh, I hope you're able to stay with us for the entirety of this conversation. It's going to be a couple of hours, but that runs quickly. And where are you going, really? You have to socially distance, so you have nowhere to go, I imagine. Uh, we will welcome your questions. Feel free to shoot some of those on our message board or the chat board. I'll check those. I, I wanna ask you though, to make sure that your questions are aligned with the theme that we're discussing. And we'll try to get some of your questions in throughout the conversation that we're having. And at the end, we'll also uh, try to save space to get some of your questions um, in. For those of you joining us on Facebook, um, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for your interest um, in this. So let's get things going, Donna, because you're almost asleep there in Geneva. <laughs> We're going to start with you and ask you to introduce yourselves to our audience and a little bit about your background and, you know, one thing that you want us to know about you before we begin. Well, as I was listening to you, Dr. Human, again, good afternoon to everyone and, and thanks to you and to the ladies and the gentlemen that I've met. Um, I'm Donna. Most times I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I was trying to represent with my colors. Then I realized it is Switzerland colors as well. So I was like, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> But I am from Trinidad and Tobago, and I was listening to your introduction, and I recognize we have a, a, a similarity. I started off in journalism, and then I made my way into disaster management. We have spent about over a decade and more, and then from Trinidad to Guyana, and then Guyana to 
Barbados to work at the regional level. And then from there through the World Bank, I moved to Switzerland in pursuit of really trying to build the alliances on the resilience and helping uh, vulnerable communities is, is my passion. So that led me to Switzerland over two years ago. And I'm still here now working with World Meteorological Organization. It's a completely different environment for me. So I really needed to start looking deeper to figure out, did I just land here or was it part of my destiny? And this is how I've ended up in this space. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, Davina, why don't we start with you? You're in Guyana at the moment. I am, thank you Hume. So yes, I am the newly installed Executive Director of Intimate Hotels of Barbados, but my previous role, I was the training operations um, licensing lead here in Guyana at the Guyana Tourism Authority. And I'm still here, <laughs> not because of, well, because of COVID really, um, but I'm okay. And I know that I'll get home soon enough. So I, um, like I mentioned just now, have been working with the Guyana Tourism Authority and I've actually worked in tourism for the majority of my life. Um, sustainable tourism, various, various sections, mostly focused on the environmental aspects of sustainability, however. I have also been involved in human resources development in the charity sector in the United Kingdom. Um, I lived there for about five years and, and, and worked there as well. And uh, so combination of my career, sustainable tourism, HR, administration, and I've worked with various tourism organizations, both at the national level in Barbados, national level here in Guyana, and at the regional level with the Caribbean Tourism Organization. I've studied tourism at the postgraduate and the um, bachelor's level. And on a personal note, something that I love to do is, is travel. So I, I am one who really can't wait for things to kind of regain some sense, level of normalcy, because I know we won't go back quite to what we had in the past, but some level of normalcy so that I can um, meet my travel goals. I have a goal to visit 45 countries by a certain time. I'm at 38 now, so I'm really hoping that well, I can meet far. that goal. No, <laughs> I really hope far. that I can meet that goal in the, next, in the next few years. So it's great to be here. Thank you for having me, Hume, and I look forward to tonight. No worries, Avina. Uh, Diani, why don't we go over to you? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for having me, Dr. Hume. Where do I begin? Where do I begin? So my name is Attorney Diani Winterfunde, and I'm an immigration law practitioner. I'm based here in Tampa, Florida. Um, and I'd like to say immigration law chose me. So in my very, very early days of moving to the United States, I remember sitting at the dining table with my mother while we completed immigration paperwork, whether it was for a family member back home or maybe it was for somebody from her church, the news quickly spread that I knew how to fill out paperwork. So my passion for immigration goes back over two decades and that's as, as long as I've lived in the United States. So winter law practice, which I manage, own and operate was the birth of that passion and it still is today. I am based here in Tampa, Florida. However, I travel throughout the continental United States where I represent immigrant families. Um, I do so with passion. I do so with love of the law. And I also do so, I also do it with love of the individuals and the families that I know that I'm going to change their lives. We're a boutique law firm. Um, Prior to COVID, we were supposed to be opening up our second brand in Ocherius, Jamaica, but COVID kind of put a damper on that. So we're still, we'll be in Ocherius pretty soon and post COVID. It is an honor for me to be here. It is an honor to sit amongst individuals like yourselves, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Dr. Hume. Thank you so much. Uh, Colleen. Hi, everyone. I'm the shy one, by the way. Um, <laughs> so my, my name is Colleen Douglas. You may be seeing that on the screen. 
I'm currently the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, which is really the first and only one of its kind in the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, before Edna Manley College, I've been in government communications for a couple of years. I started out at the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, chiefly responsible for community training. So I've been heavily involved in, in disaster management and the public relations attached to that. I have also been at the Bureau of Women's Affairs as a communications manager for some years. And I'm actively, which is probably my full-time job, is involved in the music industry in Jamaica. I sit on the Reggae, Jamaica Reggae Industry Association board as the director responsible for marketing. And I have my own private public relations company that I do publicity for artists. I've worked with some significant Jamaican artists over the years, and I'm very, very interested in oral history, especially as it relates to creative industries, and really, really committed to playing my role in, in that area for national development. So I look forward to sharing. I look forward to coming out, my out of my shell on this kind of platform. We will drag you out of our shell. <laughs> Uh, Damon, why don't we hear from you? All right. You left Grenada and fell in love with Jamaica. Tell us about that. Oh, I'm absolutely in love with Jamaica. My name is Damien Marcus Williams. I'm a community development consultant, um, project manager, and transformation coach. And all of that has allowed me to marry my passion for um, community transformation as well as education, because I bring my background in education into a lot of the community work that I do. Um, prior to that, I was on a disaster risk reduction project funded by USAID OVDA and uh, implemented by Habitat um, for Humanity. And I've been involved in community development work for about 15 years since I moved to Jamaica to pursue studies in theology and leadership. Um, I've worked in violence prevention. I've worked in um, behavior change around climate change and um, disaster risk reduction. Um, but my passion really is to connect people with their purpose. And that is what I get to do through my work. Okay, wonderful. Georgia, why don't we hear from you? Sure. It's an honor, Dr. Hume, to share this platform with you, having been my communications coach way back in 2013. Yeah, my so. first, first client. I think Georgia was my first client, either her or the Secretary of State for Rhode Island. One of the two was the first. Yes. So know. a mutual friend of ours decided it was imperative that I got connected to you being the best communications coach there is out there. Thank you. But anyway, I want to thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this event. My name is Georgia Bryce. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist based here in the beautiful city of Hollandale Beach, Florida. There's no other city on the planet like Hollandale Beach, I'd say that. Okay. <laughs> but I, I uh, work um, primarily in my private practice, building families according to pattern with children and family. And I also do couples counseling, individual therapy, uh, Christian counseling, as well as provide wraparound therapeutic services or therapeutic support for those clients who are coming out of rehab, whether it's, whether it's for substance abuse or alcoholism. But one of my primary passions connected to my private practice is that I get the opportunity to engage the community quite often um, concerning mental health awareness and mental health education. And so uh, serving in the capacity as a um, keynote speaker from time to time, maybe a panelist, maybe being a part of a workshop, going into business and actually doing workshops for uh, uh, patrons of those businesses and just being able to raise the information or raising the gauge concerning mental health because that's a very, very important aspect of our lives. I also am the owner of a second business, Building According to Patterns. See, I'm into the building. <laughs> uh, my background is environmental engineering. So as much as though I've switched over into therapy, I am still very much an engineer at heart. So as far as that second business, I get the opportunity to engage clients in terms of personal and professional development coaching, as well as leadership development. And just like Damien, I am absolutely passionate about this idea of purpose, because I believe when you discover your purpose and when you spend the rest of your life refining and serving your gift, to, the, to, to, to your community or to your generation, 
then that's where true success lies. So thank you so much for having me on board. And I certainly look forward to our discourse. Of course. Thank you so much, Georgia. Andrea? Good evening, everyone. I am Andrea Williams. I'm a regional operations manager with Hopper Health Care and Still Health Urgent Care based here in Connecticut. Um, I'm a busy mom of three. So <laughs> that is what I do. I'm a busy mommy. Um, if you find me running around everywhere day to day, <laughs> it does not stop. <laughs> I wonder how I how I keep up with it, but um, truly, so I'm tasked with leading this this force here in Connecticut, um, opening up urgent care centers with major healthcare systems. Um, that is what we do. I am an expert in that field. Um, what I do is I build teams and I figure out what they need and I, I give them the access they need to do that, and then I have them leverage that. Um, my passion is making sure that people can focus on what makes them thrive and then bring that to healthcare some way somehow. I've found that when people are able to, to be authentically themselves, you find a beautiful relationship that happens with our customers, our clientele that walk in, and they could relate to someone when they walk in the door. So that's something I've tapped into recently, and it's really helped to grow our team here in Connecticut. Um, we have established ourselves here about three years now. We've grown from having just one center to having 18, and speaking to Pivotin, we are professionals at that. We're quite innovative, um, launching into telemedicine and all of that. So we'll go into that a bit more later on, but yeah, that's what I do here in Connecticut. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. You know, when I'm listening to all of you, it sounds as if you didn't need personal branding, and yet uh, all of you at some uh, stage or in some measure approach me to, to work on your personal brand. And as mid-career professionals, we all want to succeed in our, in our industries and in the careers that we have chosen. And I'm curious that uh, each of you discovered that personal branding or really knowing what your personal brand is, who you are and what value you bring to the table was a surefire way of helping you to get where you wanted to go. But I'm curious, and I want to find out from each of you, what was the biggest challenge that you were facing? Because you seem to be on top of things right now. And I wondered what challenges did you face personally or in terms of your image, your perception, how you felt? that led you to personal branding? Did you even know what personal uh, branding was? Who wants to, to start? Because we want to hear from everybody. Uh, uh, briefly, make your, your, tell us your story. Diani, do you want to start? I can, I can jump in that only because I think I, I foolishly, foolishly thought my brand was who I was employed by. So for me, the one of my big two challenges, the first challenge was I always wanted to prove how Jamaican I was because I thought that was my brand. So whether it was, so I started my career back in the early 2000s, right? So I had the big um, head of dreadlocks because that meant I was very much Jamaican. I was very authentic. And that was how I was going to enter the room. That was challenge number one. How Jamaican can I be? The second challenge I had, because I, I've worked in spaces where very few people looked like me or even sounded like me. Um, the second challenge was that every place I worked, I wanted to take on their brand, whatever their, and at the time it wasn't called a brand. It was the agency or personal branding was not such a thing as it is now. So those were two of the big challenges I had. So at employer number one, I was this Diani. At employer number two, I was this Diani. At my business, I was another Diani. So each time you moved, you... you I, I had to... I became, I became somebody else. I, I wanted... I wanted to prove how different I was or how much I could assimilate to the employer. So I never fully understood my brand as an individual. It's almost like drinking the Coca-Cola and thinking you're a part of Coca-Cola. So I never understood Diani as a brand. That was some of the okay. challenges that I that I faced. Other folks, just jump in. Guys who are watching and listening, feel free to make your comments or your questions on the message board. Who wants to jump in here? I want to okay. jump in here, Hugh. Go ahead, darling. Um, I. I had been in, in development work for a while. And for me, while I loved the impact that I was having in communities, there was always this tension between what the social impacts were and what those, um, oh, 
deliverables and expectations from the donor agencies were. And, and I find that there was this disconnect there. And I did not know how beneficial those were for the communities that I was serving. And then there was this person known as Dr. Hume Johnson that was doing all of this work on personal branding and how it is that we can really um, situate ourselves, who we are in the workplace. And that for me was counter narrative to everything that you have been hearing. That one, we're supposed to represent mm -hmm. the organization. <laughs> And nobody has been talking about rec um, representing self. And then I bought your book and you began to ask some questions that at first made me very uncomfortable. Yes. Because I am a professional. I know who I am and I sh I'm showing up in the world as myself. But those questions helped me to recognize one that I didn't know. And I think that's the first stage of understanding personal branding is admitting that you don't know. And then, it helped me to appreciate all of those things that were later on I would identify as my unique value, the value that I brought to the table. So I was not there showing up at work and saying, oh, I need you for my bread and butter. But I was saying, you need me and you need what I bring to the table in order to transform the work that you're doing. And once I was able to do that from reading your book, then I got the personal power, you like to say, okay. enough. Yeah. to step out on my own to say okay this is no longer serving me i love the work but it's no longer serving me and like i said so the biggest challenge was confronting me and confronting I, the fact I, I, that I, I come back i want to come back to that um figuring it out and then mobilizing and moving on it because there's a big difference georgia and i talk about it sometimes where i don't i tell her i don't teach motivation i can give you the tools but how do you move from understanding your brand to actually mobilizing it. I want to get back to that with you, uh, Damien. But can we move on and, and uh, Georgia? I was gonna, yeah, since I'm already unmuted. So uh, I would say it was more of a personal crisis that brought me to the point where I had to engage me on another level. So my background is really, I started off with a bachelor's in environmental science, and then I earned a first master's degree in environmental engineering. I worked for a job um, nine years, three months as an engineer and three months into my job, I was done. Like, I, I was like, this is not what I want to do with my life. The problem was I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but somewhere along the line, it kicked in and I eventually went to get a second master's in marriage and family yeah, well, therapy. You got that second master's. You tell us about that discomfort that you were feeling at work. Oh my God. Um, you, I, I would say I actually fell into a state of depression for a good five years. It was very difficult going to work, getting up, going to work in the mornings. Um, just a lot of a lot of just feeling that sense of unfulfillment um not being satisfied and it didn't a lot of people my friends couldn't understand what the problem was because here you are working as an engineer you're a black female engineer which has all these accolades that seems to be attached to it and yet i wasn't fulfilled i was you going in engineering you wanted to be an engineer i wanted to be an engineer at one point in time but then i found out when i got into the arena I realized that this is not what I'm best fit for, you know? And so I'd always had a passion working with people. I always had the opportunity to provide solutions and people always, for whatever reason it was, would come to me to get answers to the dilemmas that they were faced with. And so I eventually moved into marriage and family therapy, but before getting into marriage and family therapy or graduating with the degree, I started building according to pattern and that's how I met you. And with that, I mean, I remember when we had our first coaching session, the, the first thing that you said to me is that you have to start owning who you are. And so the challenge for me with coaching or, or with, with uh, getting into branding was that there were parts of my life, there were pieces of me as an engineer, pieces of me as a, as a speaker, as a leadership development practitioner, pieces of me as going into therapy. I didn't know how to integrate all yeah. three or all components. And that was something that your sessions challenged me to own those pieces because they represent you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And own all of all parts of, of yourself. Exactly. Thank you very much, uh, Georgia. Can we hear from you, Andrea, and then Donna? I actually wanted to touch back on a little bit of what Damien was, was saying um, and that fear, a little bit of fear that kind of captures you. Because what, what really led me to, to look into personal branding is recognizing that unlike my colleagues, you know, they were 
distinguished and they were decorated and they had this degree and that and here I am an x-ray tech and so I wondered so you were an x-ray tech you were only an x-ray tech exactly. okay wonder, but but um despite all of that though I found myself among leadership that was way above what I thought my scope right but then I had these leaders who, who I thought were doing very well, they're tapping into my expertise. And so I wondered, you know, well, what do I do with this? And like someone else said earlier, um, you kind of try to figure out a way um, to separate this brand, this organization versus your personal brand. And that's so very important. And that's what led me to that, just fear and not knowing what to do. Um, am I Andrea, the authentic person who is very relatable? Or am I Andrea, this leader in healthcare who's pioneering and innovative and all of that? Yeah. So, you know, I just had to figure out, okay, who is Andrea and what do I really bring to the table? Why are they tapping into my skill set so much, although I am not decorated by any means um, compared to others? But it's so important once you, you get to realize what it is that you bring to the table and just owning that. Very important. Okay. Um, Donna, let me hear from you because you, you moved from the World Bank to the, to the World Meteorological uh, Organization and that's from high to high. So I, I so tell us. So to speak. <laughs> you know, I was, I was listening to everyone. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I was listening to everyone and I was saying, wow, I, for me, I felt like I was moving very fast, but not moving at all at the same time. To the point where when I, I broke free and I left the Caribbean, I left everything I knew and I ended up in the dead of winter in Europe, in Switzerland that I knew nothing about. I think every aspect or every different world collided. And I don't think people were seeing that on the outside, but I was feeling it. You know, I was feeling really disoriented. It's like, everybody's giving you accolades. Go girl, you're, you're finally reached. And I was like, reach where exactly? <laughs> Because I couldn't, I didn't feel like if I was fitting in, I knew yeah. I was doing, a, I was doing a number of things, but I just didn't find my groove. It's like I, I left, my first passion was actually journalism. Mm -hmm. I loved just finding the untold stories. I loved bringing out people interest stories. I, I just, that was me. I had a very, very inquisitive mind, but I woke up one morning and I just, I had no plan. I just knew this was it. The end had come. It was it. There was no issue really with anyone. It was just me saying that there was more to come and I moved. But in moving, I never sat down to figure out where my compass was, which direction was I going to take. Although I've lived my life saying nothing happens by accident. Yeah. So being here is not by accident, it's not coincidental. This was supposed to happen mm -hmm. and it happened. So now it's a question of how do I build on this? How do I pull together? Because if I am not sure, I don't think I could continue like this. So it's, it's really just listening to everyone. There's a passion there. There is like, I started off doing my, my bachelor's in sociology. I loved it. But then I was like, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah. I didn't see the direction of disaster risk management, but it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and everything just mushroomed because I had a plan to stay in Trinidad for six years in disaster risk management. It was cut by two years. Mm -hmm. I ended up in Guyana. Had, Guyana was never on my line of sight, but I ended up there. And then from Guyana, I got pulled to Barbados and that's how it has been going. And with the World Bank, it was, it was strange. It was really strange. It was literally a message sent to me on LinkedIn. You know, they have the headhunter thingies. Yeah. I, I saw Switzerland, I said, okay, I don't know. I don't speak French. I don't speak German. I don't speak Italian. <laughs> I'm going to apply. My name is French, so I'll apply. Mm -hmm. Then I got a call and it has been happening. So I keep telling myself, it's, it's not by accident just got to figure it out now and pull the pieces together because it's so, an opportunity. So personal branding was your opportunity to, to figure out how to put it all together. Yes, definitely. It definitely was. Thank you so much, Donna. Let me hear from you, Colleen. I, I, I know a little bit of your story, but most people uh, don't. Uh, tell me what was the, the biggest challenge you were facing that led you to, to, to personal branding that I really needed to find what my personal brand is? Um, for years, I think I was working in industry. I was working in music. I was working in media. I was doing disaster management and I was all over the place. I was also doing a lot of things and contributing to a lot of different areas, but was very unsure about, about myself. I didn't find that persons were not calling me to be the resource person on any of these areas I was actively working in. 
And I felt uncomfortable with that. I felt like I was supposed to be on the team, but I was kind of on the side cheering on everyone. Oh. And so for a long time, I felt very uncomfortable as a professional. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure of, about my value that I brought to the table in any of these spaces. Um, I think the most uncomfortable was overhearing somebody in a session saying, who is she? What does she do? And I'm thinking to myself, how can she not know me? And I've been around for over almost 20 years at the time, working in music, working with people who I thought were significant, doing a lot of projects on the side. So I was always in the background, mm -hmm. doing probably too much sometimes, yeah. not earning from it one. And so Hume, I've known you for years, and I remember speaking to you one morning, I think it was a Sunday morning. It wasn't even planned. Um, just having a regular conversation, and she said, but it's like you're a funeral planner. Someone dies, whether close friend or not. I was on it. The program was well executed, and I was doing excellent things, and but not being recognized for it and not be feeling fulfilled by it. And so the conversation for me was very, very uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable now because I'm thinking how emotional I was. That she cried. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell your so business. When, she cried during the conversation. There was a question. She said, like, what is it you're passionate about? And what is it you think that you're not accomplishing? And I just broke down. I couldn't continue at all. I, I have to admit, in as much as I've come a long way from, that's probably 18 months ago, yeah. I've come a long way from that, but I still go back into it sometimes. I retreat into that and still feel uncomfortable about what my personal brand is. Um, so that session sort of made me a bit clearer about where I wanted to be. Um, people know me as very sassy and witty, and I would be projecting on social media, kind of clean that I don't want you to talk about at my, my in my eulogy. I didn't want to be seen as that bitter girl, they used to call me bitter CD when I was on radio, because I'd be very critical of people and sometimes unkind with my comments. And so I had to shift, I had to shift the tone of what I was saying. So no, I'm not saying anything, any, I'm not saying anything different, but I'm saying it differently. And that's probably what was my biggest takeaway from that, that conversation. All right. You know what? Uh, one of the things I, I know for sure is that when I was finishing my PhD, I had a lot of skills, but I still felt very confused. And so sometimes when people uh, see us, they think that we're, we're extremely successful, we're achieving, we're earning, we're qualified. But everybody, as Georgia and, and Damien says, everybody wants to find a life's purpose. And I think that everybody has to. I think even if they're not actively seeking out what their purpose is, it's in the back of their mind. Like, you know, we don't want to be floating along like a log. People want to, to operate with a certain clarity and, and, and operate with a certain purpose. So I want you guys, having, having discovered a little bit what your personal uh, brand is, what is the biggest lesson that you want people to take away? And based on what you have experienced, what is the biggest lesson that you have learned while you've scaled your brand, you've, you've tried to make it uh, visible? There are some people that are working hard behind the scenes and they're doing great work and they have a strong brand, but nobody knows about it. And then there are other people who are not doing much, but they're visible. They're all over the place. And, and, and as Colleen says, they're getting a lot of the attention and they're getting a lot of the credit and other people stay on the periphery. So what is the biggest lesson that you think you guys have learned in the process of developing your brand? Where are you right now? What have you learned? What can you tell others based on your own experience? Well, I didn't really get a chance to share just now. Oh, and I think this kind of ties in, though, to what I wanted to say. And, and that is nothing will happen if you hide. And that really stood out to me. Um, so nothing will happen you, if you hide. If you hide, yes. That really spoke to me a few years ago. And I think that's what really propelled me into personal branding because I, I really felt hidden or even as though I was the person hiding myself. Yeah. And I knew that I had so much to give and to offer. And sometimes you see, you know, you see people on social media and media and they're bragging about they've done this and they've done that. And um, you know that you can do a really good job. 
And I, I don't like to say better than because that um, is, is kind of snooty, but sometimes you are, we, are, we are better at certain things, you know? And uh, I really felt like, and, in, and in, in tune with what Damien and Georgia said about purpose, you know, really trying to figure out what your purpose is and tying that to ensure that you are seen for who you are. So in terms of my, my experience with tourism and sustainability and being on the environmental side of sustainability for the most part, having people only see me as that person is also a reason why I really wanted to draw myself away and say, actually, no, there's so much more that I do and can offer. And I mentioned the, the human resources, and that really is a big part of who I am. I really be believe in people. I believe in human resources development and training and all of that sort of thing. And so for me, that challenge of not hiding and making sure that I try to put myself out there to let people know. Um, so that's really what I would leave with people. You know, nothing will happen if you hide. There is also another saying, um, an, an African saying, I don't remember which particular country in Africa, it goes something along the lines of, if you don't say I am, who will say thou art? And it's not a, an, an egotistical thing, but because, you know, there are a lot of people who are very happy to say, I am, I am, I am. But I really took it to heart for me because I, like Colleen, can be quite shy about saying, you know, the, the things that I would have done well or, you know, just staying in the background. And I, it occurred to me, you know what, Davina, you need to say what you've done because how else are people going to know? Yeah. And um, people are not mind readers and you need to share. So that's really what I would leave with people, those, those two things. The, one of the big challenges for Caribbean people is the idea of, of, of not appearing as if you're showing off. And a lot of people have challenges kind of uh, articulating what their brand is. But I learned from former Prime Minister of Jamaica, PJ Patterson, years ago when I was a teenager, uh, he said in my early 20s, I think, he said, but, but it's a statement of fact. So when, when you're communicating what, you, what value you bring to the table, it's, it's, not, it's not showing off, it's a statement of fact. And so I think part of what you're trying to, Davina, you're trying to communicate is something that was factual. It's not something that wasn't uh, a part of who you are. All right, guys, so I, I want you guys to, to, to the rest of you, can you tell us what would you want to leave from the, with the audience, the biggest lesson that you have learned in building your brand? For Davina, it was, you can't hide. And if you can't say I am, nobody's going to say thou art. I think I will remember that one. Uh, what other nuggets of wisdom do you have uh, for us, guys? So um, I want to jump in here. There's something I remember um, Maya Angelou said this. When someone shows you who they are, when people show you who they are, believe them. And I think about that when it comes to branding, because um, your brand is actually action. You know, what is that thing that this person does consistently? Um, it's not necessarily what you say you're going to be, but what do you do? So then um, it also makes me think about um, sometimes you don't even know it yourself, but others see it in you. So that's what I'm talking about when it says, um, when people show you who they are, believe them. So when you could tap into that thing where people are tapping into you consistently for the same thing, believe it that's how you identify that and then to believe it truly to believe it and sometimes that's difficult in and of itself um especially if you struggle with confidence right but um if someone if they tap into you for the same things over and over and over and you find that this is what i do and i do it very well believe it believe it and then just trying to dive into that okay thank you i wanted to jump in because of davina's comment about hiding i still hide a lot I am afraid to say what I want to say, especially on people. So very recently, I started writing and I submitted it to one of our local newspapers, Jamaica Observer, and they publish every week. But I didn't use my name. I used my middle name because I didn't want, I wasn't prepared for public scrutiny. So rather than say it's Colleen Douglas, I've been using Colleen Antoinette. And this week after a good friend said to me, why are you hiding? I decided to send them a picture so that people could see who I am. On your voice. And hear my voice. Um, so, so for me, one of the biggest take takeaways 
when I put my bio on paper, I was impressed with myself. I felt like patting myself on the shoulder and said that you've done well. Because a lot of times I kept thinking, I can do more, I've not done enough. But putting down everything that I've accomplished professionally, academically, made me realize that I have done well and I'm an expert in a particular area. Absolutely. And so my takeaway was that, was really putting it in writing and then sharing that with the world. I believe to strengthen your strength, the things like you just said, Andrea, the things that people say you're good at, just strengthen those. Um, and I, I used to focus a lot on my weaknesses. I used to become very concerned about whether or not I'm going to leave a H off of a word, or I'm going to pronounce a word properly. And so you're not saying what you want to say. So it's working on your weaknesses. Rex Nettleford used to say when he walks into singers, um, work, practice, practice, practice until you can't get it wrong. So mm -hmm. where your weaknesses are, just work on it so right. that you can sharpen those things. And so that would be my takeaway is really owning you, that power of you and being right and out of order, as we like to say in Jamaica, with who you are. Be be before you guys continue, let me just uh, read a couple of the comments from people. Alicia Lambert, I believe she's in the Cayman Islands. So this is co a completely Caribbean uh, socialization line, Caribbean line going on here. She said, I related to that, nothing happened if you hide. I think that was from what Davina said. Um, Professor Johnson, I think that is Darren Johnson, who is a teacher in New York. Uh, Darren is saying, love it. When I said it was a statement of fact, your skills is a statement of fact. And uh, Alethe is saying to Colleen, very, very proud of you. So guys, uh, the rest of you, any takeaways, biggest lesson you learned in the process of, of trying to scale your brand? So uh, I'll, jump in, I'll jump in here, guys. Um, I think for me, I had to learn that different is better than better. And I'll repeat that. Different is better than better. So I started my career pretty successful. So I started out in Michigan and I was successful because I was different. So it was very easy back in 2005 to land some really good gigs. I was the, the director of this, I was the assistant director of that. So I started out really, really good. And I was in spaces where my voice or my ideas were welcomed. Um, I remember starting up one of the largest law schools here in Tampa, Florida, and my voice was always welcomed. I was the one who was afraid of being different. I was the one that was afraid of my accent you know, putting the wrong syllable on the wrong word. I was afraid of that, but it was very much welcomed in these spaces um, to the point where back in 2005, 2006, 2007, all I watched were soap operas because I wanted to speak like Susan Lucci because that, that's what I thought was acceptable, not realizing that what I brought to the table was of a lot of value. The fact that I spoke differently, looked differently, acted differently was welcomed. So, I, so the thing that it brought, that it, it came home to me back in 2018 when I was struggling with who Diani really was. I was very successful. I, I like how Dr. Hume put it at the beginning, her side gig as a professor. So I owned my own business and I had a side gig as a director of a university. That was my side gig. And for me, I lost who I really was. And um, I, I, this sounds like an ad for Dr. Hume Johnson, but it, it really isn't. Um, I, I contacted her and I was like, I am so lost. I did not know what my brand is. On Facebook, I had one image. On Instagram, I was something else. I was totally, totally lost. It is only in the past couple of years, I'm gonna say the last two years, mm -hmm. where I've really come into my own in saying that different is better than better. It is to the point now where I will promote, I practice primarily immigration law. I will promote another immigration lawyer to somebody else because I know my brand. Right. I know the value that I offer. Um, I can speak, I don't speak a lot of languages, but I like to say I speak the language of the world because I've traveled to every continent except Antarctica. Um, so these are things that makes me different and I've been able to hone into that. So if I could leave anything with any young professionals listening this evening, 
different is better than better. Okay. To so piggyback uh, off, oh, go ahead, Damien. To piggyback off that um, comment, I think one of the things that I struggled with was was shame. I was not proud of who I am and the value that I brought to the table. I, I think purpose helps us to appreciate the fact that we're different and we're meant to be different. For example, I was really ashamed of leading with my faith core values. I was really ashamed of that. That was the reason why I came to Jamaica. My faith brought me to Jamaica. And it was more comfortable to say that I am the capacity development and operations manager for Habitat for Humanity than to say that I am Damian Williams, a transformational coach. Now, what is that? Yes, what is that? What is that? You understand? <laughs> what, what does a transformational coach do? And another coach again? And that led me down a path of comparison, um, mm -hmm. comparing myself to, to others. And when you're in that space, you're thinking, okay, competition. And that's a mindset of, of lack. Mm -hmm. That's a mindset of, of not an understanding the value that you bring and what you what Hume calls your distinctive advantage. But you can only understand that when you appreciate your purpose. So what I would say to any young person, old person, no matter where you are in your journey, appreciate purpose over popularity and prestige. Pursue, Absolutely. And when you pursue those, then you would you would be different in a world of similar. I am very glad you said that because so many people think that their personal brand is about attracting a following on social media and getting likes and getting uh, popular. Yeah. Whereas your brand is really what you're going to offer other people. And even people who are influencers and have millions of followers, many times they still have a, no idea what real value they're bringing um, to the table. Let me hear from you, Donna, in terms of what you wanna uh, leave with us. I was hoping you would have missed me <laughs> very quickly because I'm listening to everyone. I'm like, wow, I have a long, long journey to go because let me let me share this with you guys. Dr. Hume shared my profile, I think, yesterday, and I was super uncomfortable. There were a lot of people across social media who knew me for years, and this is the first time they actually know who Donna Peer is. Wow. They, they knew nothing about my journey. They were like... And I was like, ah, this is what I've been running away from for so long. So, um, so it's, it's still a learning process for me, getting out of the shadows and coming to the light. The light is not going to follow me. I got to find it. And, you know, I was, I was surprised and awkward, you know, in terms of telling people who I am. Because so many I, people liked your, your thing. You had <laughs> the, the most popular featured panel. And, and, I, and I remember yeah, but, but, to you the other night to say that, now this this is the reason to be more visible about what you what you can offer yeah i guess you all could see that i'm trying to like get myself small in the screen no but i've spent my life in the shadows and it, and i guess it's because of in reflection it's because of a lot of of experiences in the early days of my career where you you don't you never realize how experiences impact or fashion your perspective going forward is when you get stuck or you you come across crossroads then you realize oh it was because of that or it was because of that that I literally became very muted you know I never I never spoke about me and I remembered when Dr. Hume and I started talking after one year of of stalking each other. <laughs> almost and when we finally started talking my my entry to her was i always struggle in interviews whenever they ask the simple question of tell us something about yourself tell us about yourself i, I used to like run cringe yeah. you know ask me anything technical ask me anything you know about experience but don't ask me about myself i was most uncomfortable speaking about who i am uh one of my late professors uh, dr dr dennis brown is now deceased mm -hmm. a jamaican he was one of them who came up to me once and said you know i look at you sometimes and i wonder if you are ashamed of showing people that you know something yeah. and i i never understood it but i think it's an amalgamation of experiences over the years and i i always seem to compromise to fit in to an institution as opposed to standing in my truth being who i am and pushing through it so i'm still learning 
Yeah, it's, it's very interesting how you develop your brand and then get over that fear to get into the driver's seat because it's a process. You can know your brand and still not get into the driver's seat. So Georgia, let me hear from, from you. What's the biggest lesson you learned and what's the takeaway that you have for the audience? Sure. So um, as I'm listening to all these wonderful folks give these wonderful quotes, um, I was brought back to Westwood High School. That's my alma mater. Yay, Westwood. Um, 1988, one morning after devotion, I remember our principal, Mrs. Logan, made this statement. And believe it, I don't know how that thing resonated with me and stuck with me all these years. She said, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are for. And that thing blew my mind and traveled with me throughout all my life up until this point in time. And I think once I recognized that what I was doing wasn't what I really wanted to do because it wasn't my purpose. That statement actually fueled me to really get up and go do something with what the gifts and the talents and the skills that I know that I have and to really pursue the pathway that I know God was calling me into. And so throughout the duration of that journey, um, still working as an engineer, still doing uh, 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 functioning as an engineer, being in school for marriage and family therapy, uh, that one statement kept me going. It kept me going because it was easy to pull back. And I know a lot of people, that's one of the things that they tend to struggle with. You know that where you are isn't where you're supposed to be. You're, you're not built to be there. You're not designed to be there. But yet the fear of going forward because of the uncertainties and not knowing what's going to happen. But a ship in harbor is safe. But that's not what ships are for. And then the second thing I'd say is this. There's another quote that I found I discovered years ago that has resonated with me so well, as well as this one before. When you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. And that is the absolute truth. The moment you begin to take the first step to move towards that thing that is on the inside of you that will not die, which is called your purpose, the world begins to open up and you begin to find that you are getting connected with people and with resources and with individuals who are going to facilitate the levels of the journey that you're going to be on. We met Hume because a friend of mine recognized what I wanted to do in terms of leadership development and coaching. And she connected me to you and she said, I believe you could benefit from getting some communications coaching lessons from Dr. Hume because I see your potential. That was the universe. Yeah, that was the universe conspiring to facilitate the gift that's on the inside. So if, if I could say anything to the people that are listening, if that thing is in your belly, that won't keep you, if you can't sleep, you can't, you can't eat, you can't, you can't go to the bathroom without thinking about it, you being on your job, cringing in a corner, thinking that this is who you are, it will not let you go. That's called your purpose. And it's time for you to activate it and to go after it because playing safe is not the way to go. Yeah. Uh, guys who are listening, uh, it's uh, okay to ask a question. I'm seeing Narda Kingston, Sonia Lane, Guard Sai, Stacey Ann Hilton, uh, Basira, one of my mentees is in this conversation. Uh, guys, feel free to ask a question. Just um, write it in the message board and I'll ask for you. Uh, all right, guys. So let's talk about the present situation that we're in of COVID-19. So all of you have made great plans for 2020 and your plans have been shafted a little bit. How did you find that you adjusted? What skills, what lessons did you learn uh, during the lockdown period? How did you organize yourself? Did you just say, oh, I'm just gonna sit by and gain weight and, and survive this thing? Or did you use the time to, what did you use the time to do? What new skills did you acquire? What new ideas did you forge when you're sitting bored at home? Uh, what shall you do differently now? So tell me, how has COVID impacted your business, your brand, and how did you navigate it? Let's talk about how you operated within it first. Who wants to start? All right, I'm, since, since I'm still unmuted, let me just quickly uh, okay. jump in. So I've gotten more business. I'm a marriage and family therapist, so I guess it comes with a therapy. It comes with a territory. Um, my couples are all coming out <laughs> of the woodwork. 
getting more couples calling in to to, to see they're stressed um, out from being together during lockdown exactly <laughs> so i've i've um i think one of the things that really positioned me to be effective during this time actually is that i'm a part of a network uh, or a platform called better help so even when other therapists unfortunately some of my colleagues who are in practice full-time private practice having face-to-face -face clients and needed to shift them onto an online platform um, many of them lost lost clients because a lot of people are not necessarily comfortable working online mm -hmm. so I was always working because I always had an online present to begin with you know and so I've not I've not Thank God, I'm still going. But I think one of the things that I, I am very conscientious of is that this time is not for me. A, there's there's a crisis, but in, in my mind, every crisis is an opportunity. And so I leveraged the time that I had during this time to start thinking about the other areas that I wanted to get into business. Um, okay. uh, I want to marry my skills with other people's skills and their industries that I'm looking to get involved with right now. Uh, a friend of mine in California doing environmental health and safety, even though her experience, her genre is completely different from what I do. I recognize that there are opportunities to marry our gifts and to create a niche of some sort. So those are the things that I've been utilizing my time, apart from when I'm seeing clients, to actually start exploring. Okay. Uh, Colleen, what have you done during COVID-19? What new skills? How did you navigate your brand during that period? I'm not going to say it's new skills that I've acquired, but I've gone back to my core. My first degree is actually in literature in English, and I love reading. I love writing. I, I have always been writing. I go to events. I write my commentary. I share them with a friend or two, and they will give me some feedback, and I would put it aside. So what has happened now is that I've just decided I'm going to write it anyway. So I've been doing a lot of writing. I have one day I picked up my phone and said, let me see if Nobel would take my articles. And so I just sent her a message to say, I'm always writing and I have these things. Could I share them with you and you see if they get published? And she said, of course. Um, two days later, the, the editor for All Women reached out to me and said that I'm in receipt of your article keep them coming and we'll publish. And so I've been doing that. I'm so dedicated to it. So you took I a find, risk. Huh? You took a risk. You decided I, to own your voice. And, and they, what's, what's good is that the more you do it, it's like riding a bicycle. So each week it gets better. I've learned, I'm learning, I should say, how to craft what the, the narrative in a way that keeps people interesting, yeah. being myself in it at the same time. And so... The, the time, the little isolation, because I'm always out and about. I'm always busy doing everything else but me. And so COVID has really afforded me an opportunity to focus on exactly what I want to do and just to stop and, and, and really dedicate some time into to improving those skill sets. Okay. Um, what did you do, Dioni? All right, so I'll take this one. So. Leading up to COVID-19, I was in Jamaica studying. Prior to going to Jamaica to study, and now we're back in 2018, I had met with Dr. Hume. So talk about somebody who didn't know what they were doing. I used to sit in my car and talk about nothing and record all these crazy videos because I wanted to be popular on social media. I wasn't making jack from it. I wasn't making a dollar. All I knew was that when I posted a video, 50 people would like it and it made my day. I met Dr. Hume and in Dr. Hume's true passion, no, she said, no, that's not what we're gonna do. And so I was redirected coming out of 2018 in leveraging my brand. So I had started to make educational videos on immigration, which started to bring me business. And Dr. Hume used to say, just come out to your car and yeah, walk in a court, just record something. And I thought it was that simple. So I took all that advice and I started to make a lot of educational videos on immigration. So coming out of COVID, a lot of my colleagues did not have an online presence or an online brand. 
I had all of that going into COVID. So I have capitalized on that in that I've had one of the best marketing companies who is simply just pushing my brand. And it's funny because when they asked me for content, I didn't have to get dressed up and go in the backyard to film new content because I had so much content. I'd had so much information. So I feel like I've almost, I was prepared for a COVID kind of environment. So I spent six months in Jamaica and I still had to run my practice while I, I was still in Jamaica. So everything, my online intake system was in place. My staff in Florida was already working semi-independently because I was in Jamaica. I was using Zoom. So I was doing all of these things leading up to COVID in March. So for me, I almost loved the isolation because then I sat back and I'm trying to figure out where then is the practice of immigration law going? And I realized it probably is going to go more to an online base where individuals are going to sit home and start working on maybe their immigration application themselves more so than before. So some of the things I've done is I'm thinking of creating coursework. I'm also thinking of creating, um, making immigration law more accessible. So if I give you the information for free, or I won't use the word for free, but if I give you the information, chances are you'll reach out to me who's giving you the information with a question or something along those lines. So I've leveraged that by doing online webinars for CLEs. CLEs are um, where attorneys have to do their continuing legal education um, mm -hmm. certificate. And in doing so, I've had to reach back on some of my former career. So I worked in higher education for some time. So I'm very much familiar with the classroom setting. So now I'm marrying the two, immigration with one of my past passions, which was higher education. And I find it to be super, super useful. Um, and I'm hoping to use post-COVID or as we emerge out of COVID to become more of the the immigration lawyer who teaches. Yeah, I understand. So still improving there on there, thank you so much, Diani. There's a question that relates to what you're saying from Darren. He's saying, Dr. Johnson, what is the advice you would give to someone who sits in the corner, but is the expert in the room? How can one walk in his or her greatness? One of the things I'm going to have to say, first of all, Darren, the expert is, uh, expert is not what you know. Uh, to become an expert is what you share. So you're only an expert when you begin to share what you know. So Diony was always uh, knowledgeable, but mm -hmm. she only became an expert in immigration when she actually started to share her information. So I think what you need to do is to start sharing what you know, find the platforms that you are comfortable with, find the target market that you want to direct your messages to and start creating um, content. Uh, thank you so much, Narda. She says she has to run. She has a WebEx class at 7 p.m. Narda is a professor. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Narda. Thank you so much. Uh, Lorna is saying great articles, Colleen. She is um, enjoying the articles that you've written. All right, guys, uh, let's uh, continue this. Uh, I was asking you guys, how did you navigate COVID? Damien, do you want to start? Yeah. Yes. Well, about two years ago, I had become accustomed to the whole remote working and all of that, um, having worked for organizations outside of Jamaica. I think one of the lessons that I, I, I learned and one of the things I was able to tap into during this COVID time is the pain points of um, micro, small and medium businesses about how do I stay afloat? How do I survive? this pandemic and what i was able to do is put together a product as to how to make businesses resilient how to come up with a resilient strategic plan bringing all of my knowledge and experience from project management and from disaster mitigation to create a product to assist um, those businesses to transition and to be able to pivot um, but covid has impacted my income because a lot of the workshops that I do um, require me to go into organizations and do the training. So I've had to sort of step back and look at how could I transfer a lot of those training to an online platform. So it has, it has also led me to, to, to pivot my own career uh, and to create other streams of income. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that has been my experience. 
Okay. Who else on the panel wants to share? Davina, I haven't heard from you in a while. Sure. Um, what did you so do for me, me? I had actually, um, I had actually started a course in January related to online teaching, teaching online with um, right. the UE Open Campus, and that was quite an intense course because I had to complete it. I, I was still working. I was actually wrapping up my previous role, doing that remotely, kind of being thrust into a position as well of how to do that in terms of work. So learning about crisis communications and um, learning about COVID so I could communicate with the staff. So there, there was a bit of that as well, learning about um, coordinating stuff remotely in terms of IT and it, it was it was interesting. And then this course, continuing that through COVID, and I kept telling myself, Davina, you cannot fail this course because it's a course that is about teaching online. Mm -hmm. and you see the situation now. So you need to pass because these skills will be useful to you in the future, for sure, even more now. And even with the intensity of that course, I am pleased to say that I was able to complete the, the four modules that, that we, we had to do. And we, we have one more uh, a section to go on to, but I'm pleased that I'm this much closer to finishing. So that is something that I kind of kept myself busy with. I, I actually crave knowledge. And for me, I, I also spent a lot of time signing up for every webinar that interested me. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, things on leadership, customer service, because the thing is with webinars is even if you, when you sign up for them, even if you aren't able to attend, they usually send you the recording. So then you're able to watch it after. And especially as somebody who's taking on a new leadership role in an organization, I really feel like, and especially in this environment, I really feel like, you know, I still have so much to learn. So I want to hear from, from, from persons who have stuff to share on on leadership and business continuity and and everything involved um especially in terms of my sector tourism which has been really really hit very hard and there's so many layers of what needs to happen in order for things to open back up and so just really trying to learn um everything uh, you know as much as possible there's an audience member that. who has a question that relates to what you're saying, Davina. Uh, oh. So Sonia Lane Gartside is asking, what is one skill you rely on the most when pivoting? Definitely yeah. flexibility for me. Um, flexibility and not being afraid of change. Um, I think that's something that COVID taught me as well, because I have a lot of friends who say to me, oh, you're very, you're very brave. And I think, me? <laughs> like... I, I try, you know, for, for me, courage is something that I want to be so much. But then when I speak to people, I realize, you know what, people are very fearful of so many things. Like I, I, I move countries in a heartbeat to work somewhere else and, and, and things that other people look at me and go, you are crazy. I would never do that. And then it makes me realize, well, actually, maybe I am slightly brave. But, but with that comes flexibility. You need to be flexible. You need to be malleable. You can't be stiff and rigid and, and not able to accept the certain things. So for me, the flexibility and, and this kind of ease, I'm, I'm a fairly even keel person. So I have this, I don't really get too, too high strung. So a kind of ease and that flexibility really helps um, yeah. with, with the pivoting here. Yeah. Very good. Donna, what did you do during COVID? How did it impact your, your brand? And can you answer that question that Sonia had? What, um, what is the most important skill uh, when you're pivoting? And I'd say adaptability is what I taught my students this semester. When they were writing, Darwin was writing the origin of the species, he said that it wasn't the strongest uh, person that survive is those who are most adaptable to changing circumstances. So adaptability and malleability, all of that means the same thing. But Donna, tell me, what did you do during COVID? How did it impact your personal brand? How, how do you pivot? Well, for me, I was stuck in France, <laughs> um, literally in every means. I mean, when you, when you don't, when you have the choice of freedom taken away from you, you no longer have the ability to just move, take a bus, everything. And you have to sit still and think through. It was, it was an interesting period for me because I, I, reflecting on it now, it happened at the same time where I was faced or confronted with a decision as to whether I stay in Europe 
if I return to the Caribbean. And I struggled with it because I was like, what do I do? I have no one to talk to. How, where do I go? Then I started my sessions with, with Dr. Hume and, and everything started be, becoming clearer. I had started off by saying nothing happens by coincidence. You know, everything happens in a timing and you have to figure it out. And for me, what I recognize is that my purpose was to be here. I want to serve the region, but I recognize for me at this stage, I needed to stay here and fight the battles here. So it's so, so during COVID-19, other than listening to my neighbors, maybe I should have known Georgia by then I could have sent them to Georgia, but Georgia will have to speak French. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a real period of deep introspection and, and a painful one at times because you had to come into your truth. You have to you accept, I think Dam Damien talked about it before, you know, you have to be embracive of your flaws as well because sometimes your flaws are your strengths. And, and that's what I did most times is I sit down, start to put a plan. I've never, and I recognize I've never really worked with a plan. I just used to get up and go at, go at it. I was just going, going, going. And that's why I was saying earlier, I was going really fast, but at the same time I was going nowhere. So I was just jumping. I mean, people can look at a resume and say, wow, fantastic. But then in, at the end of the day, what are you doing? Who are you? You yeah. know, so for COVID-19 was that, was making some hard decisions, deciding that from here on is not just about a Vikey Vai approach, you know, be very purposeful and purposive, you know, if that's the word. Yeah. I'm mixing up the French and the thing now. Yeah. <laughs> so that was it for me. And I'm still doing it because now that, you know, it's like we opening up a little bit, I actually feel a lot more focused. Mm -hmm. I've been always easy. I was always able to easily adapt to my environment. Thus I can move anywhere. But at the same time, the, the self-fulfillment part of it is what I'm now realizing and I'm saying, hmm, it took a little while to get here, but it's better late than never in some cases. So adaptability is, is great, but adaptability with a purpose or sometimes repurposing your adaptable adaptability. So that, that's what it is for me. And no. for, for the purpose, thank you so much, Donna. And for the purposes of those people watching us on Facebook, Damien is saying that I've found that self-awareness makes pivoting easier, knowing who you are at your core. Georgia is saying that capacity, learn to learn, to grow, to evolve, continual commitment to capacity building, meaning building your own capacity, building your skill, continual learning. That's also essential uh, pivoting uh, skill that you need. So guys, this is like a quarter to, to seven. So I'm going to ask you guys, so what do people, what should people do differently? What is one thing you, aside from adapting and, and learning new skills, what other things that they should do in order to position themselves to operate in the new normal, in the new environment that we have to deal with um, during and post COVID? Just do. Jump. I don't know if anybody else could relate to that, but just do. I tend to be inside of here a lot. So I'm editing, I'm reviewing, and by the time I'm ready to make a decision, it's gone. Or if I'm in a conference, I want to say something, but I'm like, Ew. that's why I could relate to your, the Dioni as well, where I'm thinking I might sound bad, or mm -hmm. I might say the thing out of context. And by the time I'm ready to say it, somebody else has said it, and you still have no opportunity. So I'm the expert in the room who's very quiet. <laughs> so to speak in yeah. terms of um, Darren. Yeah. So yeah. for me, I even tell my interns now in, in where I'm working, just do just say it even if it sounds bad just say it because sometimes the greatest ideas come out of a mistake you know so just go out there and do it i could definitely speak to that too um i think the biggest thing i've learned is just to to be innovative and challenge your status quo because especially in a, in a time like this um, what has worked is just not working anymore so this is a time for you to really challenge the status quo what is that idea that's in your belly that will work it's outside of the lines it's outside of what is um, prescribed, right? For instance, in my field, um, we've shifted to telemedicine. Um, before COVID, we were seeing about not 900 patients daily, and you've gone all the way down to seeing 150 patients. But now we've got this great platform to see patients through telemedicine. And what do you do? We haven't got people who are able to run these computers and, and navigate the different applications and the software and all of that. But you have people. And here it is. Um, I'm an expert on growing people. So why not grow them in this field, right? And so then you're making them more marketable and you, you, you're, you're depositing into them, right? 
So I think one of the things there is just recognizing that it's okay to challenge the status quo. It doesn't always have to align. And someone touched on, I think it was you, Georgia, earlier said, you know, how the whole universe does conspire in your favor, you know, when you're going towards your destiny. Um, before COVID, we were seeing about two patients a day on, tele, on telehealth. <laughs> and now this has grown to, to be our, our greatest center. We can see anywhere up to 100 patients a day. And that's, that's someone being brave enough to say, hey, guys, you know, I think we can do this. And although we don't have the task force to do it now, I can train them. Figuring out what is what you need to do and just challenge the status quo and, and drive right into it. So important. Colleen? I'd have to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Colleen. Uh, unmute okay. yourself. So, so we were asked, yeah, go ahead. Just do it, really, there isn't it. It's very well with me, actually. Um, I've been just writing it rather than sitting down and pondering if I should or question myself. I've just gone in full on and, and just do it. But one of the things I think is also finding balance. For a very long time, I found it difficult balancing my personal brand as opposed to the work brand. And so I always do an- It's a work brand though. At their, and, and it work became me. I walk into a room and they say, oh, Edna Manley is here. Or I, I go to do a television interview and it's all about my private business. And I'm, I'm introducing myself as a director of marketing and communication. So deciding consciously to put yourself first and to, to ensure that you're very sure about what you're doing. And it is, it's Colleen Douglas, the art marketing professional who happens to work at Edna Manley College is where I'm at. And so, so I've, I've found what I've learned is really structuring. I think someone said it earlier, making sure that your brand is aligned on all platforms. I never usually go on Twitter. Right now I'm holding conversations on Twitter. I'm getting followers. I didn't know that was possible. Um, <laughs> because I've never cared much about the likes, to be honest with you. I usually just say what I'm saying and I move on. No, I realize I say something and people are actually responding. So I realize because they've taken the time out to respond, I know how to find the time to participate in this conversation that I've actually opened. So that is something that I will continue being a student of my profession. You always learn something every day. All right, anyone else wants to? I, I, think, I, think, I think what I would say is, look for new cheese. We can become so tethered to the way things were before we've been thrown into this new normal. Yeah. And, and I'm despondent in the midst of it. Look for new cheese, look towards the future. Okay, how, how can I really make this new normal happen beyond wearing a mask and beyond social distancing? What has this taught me about the systems that did not work for us, that did not serve us, and how can I contribute to creating a, a future that is more resilient and that leaves nobody behind? And I think if we look for new cheese, we will see the new opportunities and possibilities. And if it frightens you, then do it scared. Talking about cheese. Oh God, he got me excited. <laughs> I'm lactose intolerant, but, but talking about cheese, because your personal brand is the cheese or is the anchor to that cheese. So how did your personal brand or how does your personal brand, having some more knowledge about what it is, having the confidence to walk in that uh, brand, how does it help you to raise the bar and to give you access to what you want? Um. I'll take that, Dr. Hume. For me, it's in my prices. And I think you and I have had this conversation. Constantly. Listen, before all of this personal brand and what I have to offer, my price was always up for negotiation. Because, oh my God, they're Jamaican. Me know them. You know me can't do that. So my brand, it was always up for nego. In fact, it was like exhausting to me. I used to be afraid to put my price on the table. And I'm talking, I've been practicing for 15 years. So I'm not a rookie. I've ran all kinds of budget, but I was always afraid to say what my price was. 
once I discovered my brand, I put it on the table and I walk away. It's that simple. It is that simple. And it might look, I think it come off to a lot of people that were super confident. All of us on here, we look super confident. We've done some scary things. Yeah. We are scared. Sometimes I'm like a little duck, meaning I'm sitting here and I'm just waiting for the client to call back because I've put the price on the table and my heart is in my belly because listen, it's close to the end of the month. We need to make those numbers. And I'm scared like a little duck, but I've learned over time, I am not calling that person back and moving moving my cheese. I am not doing that. So I stick You're firm. Finding new cheese. Yeah, I stick firm because I'm confident in who I am. I'm confident in what I'm offering. And if you can't see the value in that, I think this relationship is just not going to work. I know. I, 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 I would say, um, Hume, the, the work of personal brand helps a person to appreciate the, the, the value proposition. What value do you bring? And I think mine has always been people. And I believe in the work that I do with communities, in the work that I do with organizations, that people have the intelligence and the capacity enough to assess what their problems are and to find solutions towards them. So nobody is the expert in the room except the people who are living the realities. My job as, as a community development um, specialist is to help people unearth that, to help them bring that to the fore and to use those to create the kind of transformation that they need. Um, and so when we, when I found myself in this circumstance with, um, oh, I can't do these workshops anymore. My first question was, how can I continue to serve the people to whom I believe I am called? What are their pain points now? What are the questions they're asking? asking? What are the questions that they want answered? And how can I serve them? And so I was able to bring that value with me across the, the, um, the pandemic. What problem can you solve right now? Yeah, what problem can we solve right now? And I think what people are, are struggling with in, in this time, how can I have my goals, whether they're business goals, whether they're professional goals, how can I still accomplish these? Because I've now had a spoke thrown into the wheel. Right? And so where do I go in? I come in, we look at those goals, we look at what, what, what those um, um, projections were, and we look at, okay, what are the risks and the assumptions that I made? And perhaps we need to revisit those and then plan the mitigative um, strategies towards those. Um, so, so when I talked about cheese and, and searching for new cheese, I reimagine the cheese not as my value but as the opportunities that the value that i offer creates yes absolutely um so i i wanted to add uh damien is just getting me excited about this cheese conversation <laughs> that's one of my favorite books move my cheese um so i go back to my statement my quote that i made a ship in harbor is safe uh, but that's not what ships are built for um, I believe we are fully loaded with potential, you know, potential is that thing that you have that you've not given birth to yet. It's all these successes that are still locked up in your belly that you need to give life to. And so I, I take my own words because there are no arenas that I'm looking to step in. I've been talking about it for years and now the opportunity is opening up for me to get into the business world where I bring my skills as a leadership development practitioner, practitioner or coach as well as my therapeutic skills. And everybody knows um, in the corporate setting, mental health is not one of those things that's readily embraced and talked about. But guess what? It's now at the forefront because the kinds of people that are going back into the work world are very skittish. Uh, there are lots of issues people are going to be coming out of COVID with. And so I'm challenging myself to not stay in the harbor to really begin capitalizing on the opportunities that are beginning to open up and to get into arenas where I've never been before, but I have the things, I have the skills that I could leverage and collaborate with other people to get something done and create something new because maybe that's what it comes down to. It's an opportunity to create some new things. Yeah. Who else haven't spoken? Remember we're asking about how does your personal brand uh, actually helps you to get access and helps you to raise the bar. Davina, Donna, Colleen. 
guys, this is about uh, that time when you can ask other questions. We have a few audience members still with us. Lorna, Lois, Sonia is still with us, Kwame. Uh, feel free to, to throw some of your questions here. We'll get to them at the seven o'clock hour. Sonia saying Colleen hit the head on the nail on why you need to develop a personal brand when she said, I'm an arts professional currently employed by. That's very good. You should not tie your brand to the organization you work for. It allows you to move when you need to. Too many people feel adrift if they leave their job. And that's one of the fundamental things I teach in personal branding, Sonia, is that your, your position that you have right now and the current job is not your brand. You actually take your brand to the job and you take your brand, you bring it with you when you, when you leave the organization or the employment. All right, so does anybody else want you to comment on how your brand gives you access before we move on? Sure. Um, I was listening to everyone again, and I was saying to myself, oh, so that's what it is. I became a major in a minor. Let me explain. <laughs> because I'm a minority in where I am right now, but I've turned that to my advantage. You know, I, I came into this scientific institution thinking, <laughs> what am I going to talk to these guys about? You know, can I, can I match wits with them? And then when, you know, I did this session with Dr. Human, she was like, stop saying that, you know, you're not, you're not your work, you're, you're not the job title. You have to push forward with who you are. And I actually broke through um, a few weeks ago, using all that I've learned and representing myself as a disaster risk management practitioner working in WMO. And, you know, I did it, I was very, very, tentative but I pushed through I, I as Damien said you know do it while you're very uncomfortable I was very uncomfortable I nearly passed out <laughs> because I was expecting you know I was hoping for the best but I was expecting things to just fall apart but it really went well awesome. and I'm starting to own my own space so that's why I'm saying to myself I'm actually transforming the minor into a major yes it, it's not yet complete but I'm on my way there so absolutely we're very Anybody else who wants to comment on that? We've heard from everyone, right? How do you raise the bar? Your brand gives you access. Uh, can we hear from you, Andrea? How did your personal brand, you attended my personal branding session in Providence. Prior to that, we didn't know each other. How did it help you raise the bar at work? You're in charge of about 18 Go Health urgent care centers. It's a huge responsibility. That's right. It, I, again, like, like you here, think in cinema, listening to everybody else talking, um, but being relatable and the, the ability to really forge relationships with, with folks, um, with my staff. So as operations manager, you know, you're tasked with leading people and overseeing budgets and making sure that we're well staffed and that our patients are taken care of. But then um, here's it, I got a phone call from someone saying, hey, we're going to start a new health system and I need you to talk to the people because you're going to lose their jobs. And you're thinking, what does that have to do with me being an operations manager? But recognizing that that is my brand, the ability to connect with people and be relatable. Um, when someone listens to you and they could say, you know what, I can relate to that. I, I see myself in her. She sounds like she, she means what she's saying, you know? So, so just knowing that that force is there and just leveraging that. This is what I did in, in COVID and going back again to my staff again, where we had to train them up here because they don't even believe in themselves, recognizing that they have that skill set there, but sometimes somebody else sees it in you. So once that person could identify something within you, you just fly with that. Okay. Thank you guys. I'm still waiting for more questions from our audience members. Uh, this uh, half an hour that's left is for you to ask questions. So feel free to do that. So guys, I want to end this uh, inspirational conversation with, with finding balance. And I did admit to you guys uh, last week that I have no balance. I, I am working too much. I, I feel overwhelmed sometimes because I do have a lot of pots on the fire and I like to commit. If I'm, if I'm engaged in something, I like to give 100% and I like to commit. I like to see the results and I, and, and I do work hard. And so sometimes uh, I feel like I'm going crazy. How do you stay sane? What are you involved in? Uh, community involvement, how do you rest? How do you find relaxation? Because if we don't have health, we can't do all of the wonderful things we're doing. So how do we maintain 
uh, how do you guys maintain that, that balance and uh, give our audience listening some advice on that? We can't always be going, going, going. How do we find balance? How should we find balance? I want to jump in here because um, that's something that I really struggled with, um, finding time management, essentially, um, that work-life balance. And what I found is setting hard boundaries and knowing how to say no. But in saying no, recognizing that if you are the expert, um, I find that being a leader means you have influence. So here it is, it's a unique opportunity to give somebody else the baton, pass it on to somebody else, give somebody else the opportunity to grow and to shine. So when you're saying no and setting up the boundaries and saying, you know, I can't do this, but here's someone that I know can. Now you're, you're becoming like a go-giver, you're, you're multiplying. Yeah. And you're adding to someone else and giving them that ability to, to grow and to shine and to, and to show what it is that they, they can give. Um, and then just being a coach instead of rescuing. When you rescue folks, you're not giving them the ability to grow. So I've, I've learned to, to coach and not rescue. Coach and not rescue. I wanted to jump in because I used to be very consumed with work. I would be at work from seven in the morning. When I'm home, you can email me or call me anytime about work. And absolutely no regard for my spending time with, the, with, with my two girls at home or just finding the downtime to focus on, on my private business. And so, that balance for me is knowing when to turn off from my day job. My day job ends at a particular time of the day and I consciously decide, unless it is something that's really pressing, I consciously decided that I'm finished with my day job now. I'm giving you a little bit more than you pay me anyway. So when I get home, I'm going to focus on building my own business, building my own brand, spending time with family. During this time, I am um, human, so that the beginning that I happen to live on a deep side. And so the, the, the sound of the waves is absolutely therapeutic for me. Okay, um, we're green with envy. Um, don't be, don't be, no, don't hate, appreciate it. So, <laughs> so I'm up early enough, getting a little bit of walking in, and it helps because the skin looking nicer, dropping off some of the unwanted pounds. And it also just gives you some time for quite self-reflection. Um, spending a little bit more time in the kitchen allows you to actually prepare healthier meals. And you find, I find what happens to me when I'm, when I'm eating better, I have more energy to, to wake up earlier. I go to bed on time, like I'm in bed by 9, 10. And I'm able to wake up when everyone else is asleep at about 2, 3 and do some work. So that balance is really, and I love friends. I'm, I'm that friend who will always call you. Even if you get annoyed, you don't even have to call me ever. I will constantly call you because I do think, especially- I'm familiar with her. Oh, what was that? I'm very really familiar with her. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's reaching out to your tribe for them to push you along, to give you that push sometimes it's reaching out to them to, to share your ideas with them and to grow from their own inputs into that. So I think it's a wonderful time. The best time is now when you have more time at home and you're able to focus some more. And that's how you find the balance. And I think after doing it throughout COVID, it's just going to become a good habit. Um. Work-life balance, absolutely crucial. A lot of my clients, I have to help them work on that. So it would be very hypocritical of me not to be practicing it in my own life. But I'm very, I'm, I'm kind of type A, a little bit, a little, little bit under Dr. Hume. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm one of those people who believes if you work hard, because you have to work hard, but you need to also be diligent or just as diligent in taking care of yourself. So by virtue of the job that I do, where I'm engaging people every day who are constantly putting their, transmitting their information to me, that's very weighty. I'm very intentional with self-care. And I think if you're not intentional, then it's not going to happen. So there is a time when I need to shut my computer off. There's a time when I need to separate myself from everybody that's, you know, whatever it is that people are, are, are experiencing or whatever their issues are. So I set a time when I am not on my computer. 
At, I get on my, I start working at 8.30. At 6 o'clock, 6.30, I'm done. It doesn't matter what emergency is happening to someone. It's not going to become my crisis. And I'm very diligent with that. And then there's a day out of the week on Fridays where I do absolutely nothing. And I am committed to that as well. Um, just like Miss Colleen, the beach is just down the street. And I could tell you right now, Hume knows I'm very traumatized by the fact that I can't go to the yeah. beach. <laughs> and, and hours. they open up the beach for three hours and you can't stand you can't sit you can't swim you better <laughs> keep it moving <laughs> but you know um i really believe that being intentional setting aside setting aside time to to get your r and r in is crucial because after a while even the person who is most diligent with purpose if you're not taking care of yourself very well you begin to lose who you are and then what's the whole point and I'm familiar with Georgia having her beach chairs down on the beach, parked for hours at a time. And now she has to keep it moving. I can, be, can imagine that's very traumatic for you, Georgia. <laughs> All right, guys, anyone else? Uh, how do you maintain balance? How do you maintain balance in Geneva, uh, Donna? You're away from family. How do you maintain your balance, your sanity? Cross the border. <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, would assume that France is more exciting than Switzerland. No comment on that, um, <laughs> right? Because I, I, no, but I, it's interesting because I thought I had work-life balance until I actually got to Europe. You know, it, it was it was a culture shock for me coming here, and people actually do cut off at a certain time. They do. They you know, do. I'm there still plugging away at the computer and I'm looking across and I'm seeing everybody going through, running for the bus, running for the train. I'm like, what's wrong with them? I do <laughs> but, they, but they were probably thinking, what's wrong with me? And I've, I've so I've had a, an opportunity to really reboot yeah. my computer. And I'm trying now to practice again. At this time, we cut off weekends are mine. You know, the temptation is always there to do some work over the weekend and I'm not pulling back. But with COVID-19, unfortunately, we went back up the, the curve and you're doing much more work, but I'm telling myself, no, you know, we got to come back again. You've accommodated the circumstances. Now you just have to reset and do it because it's important. You know, nobody, something I learned when I was in the media where we used to jokingly say amongst ourselves that, you know, if you, if something happens to you tomorrow, nobody's going to remember you. They're going to leave a card. If you're lucky, they might say something and that's it. And they replace you. You know, and I'm saying to myself, where have I forgotten that? What happened along the way? So now COVID-19 forced me, yeah. you know, to find that those deliberate spaces to stop is, is somebody else's emergency. It can't be my crisis, as you said, Georgia, and you move on. But here you see it. You see the deliberate cut separation. This is work, this is vacation. And when you go on vacation, be on vacation. Don't be responding to emails, answering calls, joining meetings. You're defeating the purpose. Okay. So I'm le I'm relearning. I'm like a child learning to walk and talk and run again. Yeah. Me too. In that regard, I have a question here from Sonia. She said she's interested in what Diane said earlier about being authentically Jamaican. What have you learned in going from an environment where you're part of the majority to one where you're in the minority? And I can answer that. There is a benefit to that in that you stand out and people know you're different, get to know you before deciding how to treat you. Have you learned, experienced anything else that can influence your personal brand? Thank you for that question, Sonia. I spent five years as a student in New Zealand and then I went on to work uh, in Australia teaching journalism. And I was always in the minority for those seven, eight years. And one of the things I brought with me uh, from Jamaica was my strong sense of, of confidence. I, I was confident in what I brought to the table. And I think that there's a collective confidence in Jamaica uh, that when you're in a foreign country, we, we, when we enter a room, we have arrived and we, we operate with that level of confidence. And the second thing I brought with me was my own set of values. Here I was in a multicultural environment because there were people from elsewhere. There are people from everywhere in New Zealand and Australia. And what I realized that I had to do in order to survive the environment was to remember what my core values are. And many times you have to adapt to a new environment. You do have to adapt to the new rules. You move into a new job. There's a culture in that organization. You have to adapt to the culture, but you also have to know the self that you're taking within that space. 
and stand in the strength of, of who you are, what your core values are, and what you bring to the table that's different. And if you're able to be confident about that and own your voice in that space, even if there are moments when you have to operate in the way they operate, then there's always something else that you can add to the table. I don't know if Diani or anyone else want to add to that. She's saying, have you learned to experience anything else that can influence your personal brand? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I think one of the things I that was very clear to me was that people had a lot of perceptions about Jamaicans. Um, so when I moved from Jamaica, I moved from Jamaica to New York. And I like to say I moved from one Jamaica to another Jamaica because I moved to New York City where we had a, a lot of Jamaicans. So by the time I, I left New York City for the state of Michigan, most people has they've never really interacted with many Jamaicans. So they had their perceptions. So I had some bad habits um, along with my confidence. I also had some bad habits. One of those was showing up when I felt like it. In the professional world, it didn't work. So I had to retrain myself. One, I had to show up on time. What served me really well too was always being prepared. So if I knew I had a meeting, a conference, or whatever I had going on, I was always prepared. So showing up on time and always being prepared, those things really served me well in my career outside of, outside of where I was the majority and, and now considered the minority. Well, that's a very good point. Can I, can I jump in here as well? Of course, Davina. Quickly. Sure. So, um, in terms of me being in Guyana as well, I can contribute here because I think one of the things that I did that I learned from here was not being fully myself from the very beginning. And I, I've, I've come to realize, you know what? I, I say to myself, Davina, be who you are and be who you are from the beginning. So when I, when I first arrived here, I arrived at work and some people may say I'm particular. So you have these quirks and idiosyncrasies about yourself that you think, oh, they're gonna think that, you know, this girl is a weirdo, she's a freak, or why is she, you know, so, why, why does she care so much about spelling and grammar? And, you know, why, why does it, you know, it's, it's, it's about excellence with me. So I felt that I was like easing, you know, easing myself into thinking, oh, you don't wanna say something, too early to someone because you know you don't want to step on anybody's toes and you don't want to do this and you don't want to do that and then when you realize that you've been slipping and sliding the time to 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 actually be who you are has passed so that when if you now try to be who you really were people are going to be like but hang on a minute this was fine with you before why all of a sudden you're behaving so stiff and strange right you know so I, I said to myself, you know what, Davina, you need to be who you are from the beginning. This is who you are. Don't be ashamed of it. If you are a stickler for spelling and grammar, that's who you are. It's about excellence. So who doesn't like it? They can, whatever. You know, this is who you are. Don't worry about it as long as you're not, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, immorality and these kind of things. But if, if you have a certain level of professionalism that you like to carry with you, carry it and be it from the very beginning. So that was something that, um, an experience that I, I, I had here that I, I really learned from and I, I don't intend on, on, on faking it in, in the future. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? I, I wanted to contribute to the discussion around balance. Okay. Um, that is something I have disabused myself of i i don't believe balance is possible and for the rest who talked about it i believe what we have is learning to prioritize depending on the seasons in our lives because different things um carry different weight according to where we are in our journey um i have learned to treat my life as a project so i use a log frame just as so i was doing project management and be intentional about scheduling time for my, for my mental health. Because one of the things that I, as a professional, I also struggle with is my mental health. Um, diagnosed as bipolar disorder, um, with a bipolar disorder, 16 years. So I have mm -hmm. to be intentional about creating time and space for, 
for taking care of me mentally. So I, I, I put it in a, in a log frame and I pencil out time for when I'm going to go to the river. I don't like see like, um, like um, Colleen and, and um, Andrea, is Andrea or? All right, I don't like sea like that. I like the river. So I pencil in time for that. I also pencil in time for when I'm going to write and just perhaps have a little time at home with some scented candles and a glass of wine and just introspect. Um, but I don't think um, it's possible to achieve balance. I think it's about prioritizing and making time, time management, managing your time in such a way that you are able to take care of you. I want to jump into that. Okay. Go when ahead. We were talking, we talked about how lonely you can get when you're at the top. And sometimes you have to realize it's okay. No man is an island, right? Um, so sometimes in speaking to intentionality, sometimes you have to rely on someone else to be that person to hold you accountable to say, hey, but no, you need time as well. You know, so so I, I definitely agree with all that, you know, pencil in the time on your calendar and that phone is ringing. And, but yes, you know, this is your time. This is, this is my time. And uh, one of the things I've done recently is to go back to uh, my spirituality. And even that sometimes is difficult because you say, oh, you know, you're just sitting here, right? But then something important is happening that you need to tend to. But what is more important than you being able to give your highest self, right? What, what could be more valuable than that? You operating in the space where you are at your highest self. And, and it's so true, being intentional about that and protecting that space is so important, so very important. Um, but recognizing that no man is an island, no man is an island. So sometimes you do need somebody else to help you with accountability and that consistency. Okay, uh, so guys, we have about 10 minutes left in this conversation. There are a few things that I want to remind our audience who is watching on, on Facebook about uh, some advice, show up on time. Uh, Lauren and Lois, who is in this conversation, love to so dress up, get up, dress up, show up. And being prepared, and this is something that we talked about even last night, Colleen and I were talking about that. I never, ever want to wing anything. I know the thing that I'm doing. I've done it for a few years, personal branding, so I know it. But I still want to prepare what I have to do so that there is clarity and there's no confusion. And I sound really credible. That's very important to me. Uh, be who you are from the beginning, uh, the Venus says. So if you're showing up, you have to show up as yourself from the beginning. Don't wait to switch in the middle. And one thing that Georgia said, which really resonated with us today, is if a ship is safe, in, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. So you have to go out and um, uh, take your adventure and take risks and and leverage your personal brand um, in ways that you wouldn't ordinarily be thinking of and don't hide yourself. And one of the things I always remind people about in personal branding coaching is that being an expert is not what you know. We all know a lot of things. Uh, being an expert is really what you share. And so, um, and that's where I'll leave it. You guys uh, should share your knowledge and we're encouraging other people that sitting by and watching other people uh, succeed uh, you can't do that. If you have some skills, it's important for you to, to, um, Sonia is saying that she was chatting to a client currently in Germany and, uh, it's a real culture change there being two minutes late is taken very seriously. Yes. And I was a news reader in Jamaica. I remember being a few seconds late for the news one time and Francois had a good talking. I had a good talking to from Francois. And the news didn't start a few minutes after 5.30, it did start at 5.30. And so I always made an effort to be ahead of time. Uh, but guys, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to ask you, what's your final takeaway that you want to leave with our audience? And then we'll wrap up um, for today. It's final takeaway for the audience. What's the one thing that you want them to know? I'll, I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. Um, so my final takeaway is with a short story. So 9-11 happened. So I don't know if any of us on the panel lived through 9-11. I lived through 9-11 in the Bronx, New York. And that year after 9-11, I decided to relocate from New York 
to go to law school. Everybody thought I was crazy because it was a trauma. The world was going to end. We were not going to fly anymore. You're going to invest all this money to, to go to law school. And I threw my two kids at the time, Daniel and Jamani, who are now adults and are back in my house because of COVID. I cannot believe it. Um, so I threw them in the back seat of my 1998 Nissan Altima and I drove to Lansing, Michigan and I went to law school. So that was um, opportunity during a crisis. Yeah. 2008, 2009, I'm living in the state of Michigan. The economy fell. I packed my bags and I moved to the state of Florida during the downturn in the economy. Um, last year when my practice is going really well, I packed up my bags again and I went to Jamaica and studied. So I'm leaving this with everybody or anybody who's watching jump. It doesn't matter what is going on around you. You would be surprised when you are the only person that's jumping or growing during a crisis. You are going to come out so much stronger. I still have individuals that I left in New York back in 2002 who we all had planned to go to law school. 9-11 happened and they didn't go and they're still there not having went. So if I can leave anything with someone who's watching, it is your time to jump, there's opportunities within crises. Yeah. My take home, my last words would be, take the uncomfortable but necessary journey into self-discovery. Knowing who you are is your superpower. Um, I guess my final words would be um, feel the fear, but do it, you know, and then trust your plans to God. I really believe that there is a master blueprint that bears my name. Every person has that. And so you have the capacity to show up in all of your fullness to do what is in your heart to do. And if a lot of you, and I know there are a lot of people online right now who have dreams in their heart that they want to give birth to, don't be afraid. The worst thing that could ever happen to you is that you get on your deathbed and you're thinking of all the things that you could have done, should have done, and you didn't do it. Feel the fear, but do it anyway. I say don't allow the, the lack, don't allow lack to stop you. You know, don't allow the fact that you haven't got a degree to stop you. If you want to do it, just go ahead and do it and bring you to the table. That's all that matters. There's only one you. So therefore that cannot be duplicated. You can duplicate a degree. Everyone can have the same degree, but there is one you. So go and bring you to the table. So very similar to what Andrea just shared, we all have a unique value. Ooh. Sorry. Go ahead. And we all have a unique value and we should find out what that is. It may be hard, it may, may require some drawing out from Hume <laughs> and some tough questions, but we should all find out our <laughs> unique value because it's really linked to our purpose and what we offer to society. And get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like, like we all shared, George just shared, Andrea it, and Damien, you know, nothing grows from, from comfort. So we have to take the plunge, like Diani said, jump and the net will appear. Take the plunge. The, 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 again, similar to what Georgia just said, they say the graveyard is the wealthiest place because so many people have died with the gold inside. So never let that happen to you. Don't, you know, make sure you expend your gold here on earth. Don't die with it inside of you. I, I would say to lean really find your passion, acknowledge the work that you put in, the, the work that you put in for all these years. And I'm borrowing from Georgia, just do it. Have we heard from everyone? Okay, I, I think we have, we have about two, two, someone wanted to say something? No, I was just going to do my two cents and just said the first okay. step is always the most difficult and once you've made that first step it gets easier along the way once you don't give up okay i know it's very very late in 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 switzerland right now what time is it now now donna 
do you really want to know? <laughs> yes. It's 1.30. Oh my goodness. I'm going to let you go. You're my speaking to your future. All right, so guys, I can't tell you how, how profoundly inspirational it was to have you all together. And it's, uh, I've never thought of having all of the people that I've worked with in one way or another together in a room talking about their personal brand. It's one of the, the ideas that came to me during COVID. So uh, our task is really to amplify the conversation about personal branding because it really is truly about empowering other people to find their purpose. And I'd love for you guys to use this panel as a jump off point for you know, continuing the conversation about personal branding, sharing your own story so other people can be inspired to find and define their personal brand as well. We also have to build allies. And one of the things I realized, I mean, a few of, of you guys didn't know each other before, uh, we began this conversation. And so uh, it's important for us to build allies, uh, build each other up, make each other better so that we can become more impactful in our careers, in our industry, and certainly for our community. I really appreciate that it was such a diverse uh, panel and all Caribbean people, I must say, uh, and that is wonderful to have the Trinidadians, the Barbadians, the Jamaicans, the Grenadians uh, in the room together and you're brilliant and we really appreciate this is black excellence in all its uh, glory and i really do appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your your knowledge and sharing your time hopefully we can do this another time again uh guys uh listening you can grab a copy of my personal branding book brand you it's available on amazon if you really want to get started on discovering what your dione has it always has it <laughs> This is what it looks like, <laughs> uh, brand new. Uh, reinvent yourself and redefine your purpose. And remember, it uh, doesn't matter how old you are, it's never ever too late to reinvent yourself and unleash your personal power. My name is Dr. Hume Johnson. Thank you so much. Take care, bye-bye.